Let me pray for us as we begin our session. Our God and our Father, open our hearts to the Word, and your Word to our hearts. Exalt your name and your Word above all things. Let your Word burn in our hearts as it burned in the hearts of the disciples on the road to Hermias. And teach us, Lord, to be like your servant Jeremiah, that your word burn in us. Speak to us at the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth, let it be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. I didn't mention that I'm a married man. My wife, Wanjiko, and I have been married for 36 years, 36 years. And, um, we have three sons that are the offspring of my wife's womb, adults, and two of them are married. Our oldest son, Baraka, his wife, Betty, they have three lovely children, our grandchildren, Urkai, Mudaka, and Ikeno. And uh, we learned that we should have had our grandchildren before we had our children. <laughs> our son, Wangi, is a practicing advocate at the High Court of Kenya in Nairobi. And our last born son, Muraya, and his wife, Monica, serve in the in Mombasa. So I'm happy to hear someone talking about Mombasa behind there. Now I want us to look at the impact today, and we'll also look at inheritance from the Summer on the Mount. How does Jesus help us to think about the questions? What will I leave behind? Impact, legacy, contribution. And the question, where will I be in eternity? What happens to me when I die? How do I prepare for death and eternity? Do you know this card? Raise up your hand if you know this card. Which country? You should all know, you're Kenyans. Come on. Kenyans have been talking about this country. No. Come on, Kenyans have been talking about this country. Haiti. That's a flag of Haiti. I want to tell you a story about Haiti. A friend of mine was born in Côte d'Ivoire, in French, Ivory Coast, in English, where to a family where the father was the fetish priest of the village altar. They practiced the African traditional religion the worship of ancestors and spirits of the past. This young man was next in line to inherit this mantle from his father, who had warned his family from ever having to do anything with Jesus Christ. They could pursue anything, but they, should, they could not consider having to do anything with Jesus. He studied and went to the university in Côte d'Ivoire and he came to Christ through a friend on campus and he grew in his faith immensely. A faith that put a deep burden in his heart naturally for his family and he secretly shared his faith with his mother. And his mother had wanted to believe in Jesus but was afraid of dishonoring her husband. And my friend found courage to tell his father about his faith in Christ after much prayer. And his father, surprisingly, but by the grace of God, blessed him and allowed him to continue in this path. After which his mother became a secret follower of Christ. God continued to work in my friend. 
He graduated and gave up his career path to go to Niger as a pioneer missionary among people of a cross-cultural and rich background. And in this country, he had a very fruitful campus ministry. I witnessed it myself firsthand. And a fruitful ministry reaching across cultures and boundaries, including impacting a village community with the good news. He told me a story of how one of the young men that he had been reading the scriptures with from a focused background invited him for a wedding in the extended family and he went to his village and everybody when they found out who he was would tell him oh you're so and so we've been hearing so much about you from our children because he had been reading the scriptures with young boys from that cultural context today Andre, that's his name, and his wife are prayerfully considering, planning, and preparing to move to Haiti. Now, Haiti is a country that is at war. And it is a kind of war that is not known. The war, the, the, the war of lawlessness, where you cannot govern, where every corner is controlled by, by lords that have arms where there's no government. Nobody wants to go to Haiti. Andre and his wife, and another couple from Burkina Faso, they are preparing to go to Haiti, which could be the most dangerous place on earth today, in terms of a place where there is not a normal type of war. Can you imagine the eternal impact this friend of Andre will have for leading Andre to faith in Jesus Christ. You have no idea, I have no idea what God does when I lead and when you lead somebody to faith in Jesus Christ. Because the future of every believer is as bright as the promises of God. Do you know what the first three verses of the Bible are? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God over moved upon the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And it was so. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 3. What do we learn from God about himself? What does he teach us about himself from these first three verses of Genesis chapter 1? Imagine this. This is the first recorded revelation of God. Surely there must be something we must learn about the nature and the character of God from the first three verses that will be germane throughout the Bible. God is eternal. He has no beginning because he was there in the beginning and he created the beginning of time and space. So God is eternal. God is creator. God is the possessor of heaven and earth. He owns the patent for all of creation that is visible and invisible. And I want to focus on this next part. God turned chaos into order. God turned emptiness into fullness. He turned barrenness into fruitfulness. He turned darkness into light. The first evidence that we see of God is that he's doing something good that we would call now transformation. He turned darkness to light. Barrenness to fruitfulness, emptiness to fullness, chaos to order. There is no amount of chaos, emptiness, barrenness, darkness in the whole of human history that God does not come in and transform. A picture of what Christ accomplished for us 
on the cross of Jesus Christ. His own cross, I should say, brother. What should I leave behind? And I'd like to focus my thoughts from two passages of scripture in chapter 5 as we think about impact. First of all, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. No do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And I will make a few references to other passages as we continue. And so Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You and me in Christ are the salt of the earth. Salt is generally used to preserve foods from decay and to suffer or add taste to them. Salt blends into food, becomes invisible, but it is very visible through its flavor and taste. And simply put, believers in Christ are called to be people of impact and influence in the midst of a decaying world. Inasmuch as salt is also used as a preservative to slow the process of decay. The very fact that we are present in a fallen world is a common grace of God that prevents the world from total destruction. You remove the church, you remove believers, the ecclesia of Jesus Christ, that's the New Testament word for church, ecclesia. You remove the ecclesia of Jesus Christ from earth and the common grace of God is removed. Abraham himself petitioned the Lord, his God, to not destroy the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if he found, if God found certain righteous people in him. You and I are called to be like God himself, who in the beginning of time turned chaos into order, emptiness into fullness, barrenness to fruitfulness, and darkness into light, to the extent that we partner with God. Because it is not us who do this, but it is God who works in and through us. He has put you and me on this earth to impact and influence people towards the goodness of Jesus and its consequent fragrance. This word for salt that Jesus used referred to natural salt, which was used to purify, cleanse, and preserve from corruption. It is not the salt that we use today that we commonly call sodium chloride, which is a chemical. This was a more natural salt. And he uses the word metaphorically to describe the influence and impact of believers. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? And the word testes there literally means becoming foolish. This salt was impure, mingled with vegetable and earthly substances so that it might lose the whole of its saltiness and a considerable quantity of earthly matter would remain. This was good for nothing except that it was used to place on paths or walks as we use gravel. In other words, the salt in the time of Christ, when it lost its saltiness, it was thrown away to be trampled under. The way we put gravel on a the path, they would put that salt there and men would trample over it. It had no more use for food except to be trodden under food by men. It's a similar practice today in some parts of the Holy Land. Believers who lose their salt are generally trodden underfoot by men. They are ignored, they are mocked, they lose respect, credibility, trust. They cannot speak anymore concerning matters of faith or integrity. Like many of our people today who go to public meetings and they say, what has he been? what has he been? And these are people who have no faith in Christ at all. It is a terrible thing indeed for believers 
to be trodden underfoot, to lose their taste, to lose their credibility, to lose their ability for people to listen, not to trodden upon them, not to trod upon them. You and I need to be the kind of believers that the people around us will ask questions, will seek answers from us because there is something about our lives that tastes good, that smells good, that looks good. And this is God's plan that we should impact our relationship to the goodness of Jesus so that His mercy, justice, and humility is visible through us. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And several months after Jesus spoke these words, he said of himself, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know, light is often used in scripture as a metaphor to signify knowledge and life in the moral sense. And darkness, on the other hand, is used metaphorically as a symbol of ignorance and death. And Jesus used the word light to illustrate that his disciples would be people of influence in the moral sense because, as we saw, they reflect his character. Just as a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, you can see it. So too, believers, light cannot be hid, but will shine in the household. The word house there means household. It means oikos relational networks, not just me and my wife and my children, but my neighbors, my colleagues at work, my relational network, that my light will shine before my household and before all men. It's as if God has set believers up upon a hill to be visible to all men. We, in Christ, cannot be hidden. Jesus makes it clear that the whole purpose of shining in this way is for the Father to be glorified. You know, many of the cities in Judah, including Jerusalem, were built on the sides or the summits of hills and mountains. And therefore, they could be visible from afar. It could be that Jesus pointed to such a city as he preached this sermon from a mountain. It is impossible for believers to be unseen by the world. It should be impossible for believers to not be acknowledged as people of faith who are different, a peculiar people, a holy nation, a people who belong to God, who declare the marvelous deeds of God who has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Do the people in your relational network, your classmates, your colleagues, your neighbors, your friends, do they smell the aroma of Christ in you and in me. Jesus expects you and me to influence and impact our relational networks by his words and it gives light to all in the household. He expects us to impact men generally by his words, let your light so shine before men. Simply put, we are light in a dark world. He has left us in a dark and decaying world that we might be his light. And there is no doubt about it. When we base our identity on Jesus, when we seek to be intimate with him, when we are growing in imitating him, when we truly know and experience that we are inside his kingdom and family, when our interpersonal relationships are anchored on living as forgiven forgivers, then our impact and influence in this world will be inevitable. What is invisible, our inner values and beliefs will become visible through the impact of our character, our good works, our relationships. And these words of Jesus of being sought and light are central to everything that we read in the Old Testament and including in the New Testament epistles. 
Jesus is speaking about the essence of evangelism. I cannot be a witness if my life is not a witness. I cannot speak if my life is not already speaking. And it was St. Francis of Assisi, a godly man, who said, preach Christ, and if possible, use words to emphasize that God has called us to be like seeds planted. And Jesus gave many parables about the seed of the kingdom planted so that we could germinate and bear fruit that people look at our lives as seeds of the gospel and they are attracted to the Christ in us, the hope of glory. And I want to read Matthew 5, 43 to 47. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And in this passage, Jesus clearly mentions that we need to be the kind of people who associate with the lost. The word Gentile, uh, figuratively speaking about those other people on the outside, the lost. We need to be people who associate, who interact with the lost around us so that they may experience Christ in us, the hope of glory. We moved to Mombasa, my wife and I, and our three boys. Our youngest son, Uriah, was one year old when we moved. And my first landlord, I had two landlords, my first landlord was a, a, a Somali man. And um, one day in my bedroom, I found a Quran. And um, I got a little bit uncomfortable having a Quran in my house because I was very prejudiced. Thank God I'm not prejudiced anymore. But that time I was very, very prejudiced against anything to do with the religion and practices of people of the book, the Quran. And so I, I wondered, what do I do with this? So I called him uh, politely and asked him to come and pick the Quran, and he did. And when he came and I passed it to him, he took it from me with his right hand and he put it like this on his chest after kissing it and thanked me profusely. And years later, I thought to myself, I lost an opportunity for the gospel of the kingdom. I lost an opportunity for a conversation about the gospel. I lost an opportunity to engage with him from his book so that we could begin to talk about what this book says about Jesus or the Messiah. I could have done a better job associating with my landlord in Mombasa. But you know, when we left that house after one and a half years, and I went to see him and I told him that we were leaving to move to a bigger house because we needed a bigger house, he looked at me and he told me, Naomba uniletea mtu kama wewe. He wanted me to bring him a tenant like me, who, in his words, was faithful and reliable. And I brought him another person just like me, my, my name's another Kimani. Now this Kimani went a notch higher. When he left, the landlord, when he left Mombasa and moved back, I'm not sure that it was to Lamu, he left his house to be managed by who? Kimani. Even when Kimani moved to another house, he managed this landlord's house. The aroma of Christ that is visible because we interact. How many of you have read through the book of Genesis? Don't be ashamed. How many of you have read through the book of Genesis? Good. I ask that because I want to talk a little bit 
to understand this context of the passage we are reading. How did Abel, Abel, I don't know how to pronounce that name, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph evangelized in the book of Genesis? How did they evangelize? What was evangelism for them? For this man of God, heroes of faith in the book of Genesis. Who do you see going around preaching the gospel of the kingdom? The gospel of repentance. All of these men demonstrated the promise of the good news. Faith that God would justify the ungodly. Faith. Faith in Christ. Figuratively. That became a reality. They demonstrate this promise of the gospel and the kingdom of God by their lives. And sometimes God orchestrates circumstances enabling them to share their convictions concerning who they were and what they believed. For example, the famine, when Abraham has his famine and then he goes to Egypt, and then God does something not very nice and tidy and pleasant to Pharaoh. Like, don't, don't, don't you mess around with my servant and his wife. You don't touch that woman or you are a dead man. And he calls Abraham and sends him away. Or like Joseph, who is in, has been sold to slavery by his brothers. And he goes to Potiphar's house and things happen and Potiphar recognizes this man. I can trust him. And then Potiphar's wife accuses him falsely, he's put in prison, and the prison order recognizes, I can trust this man. And finally, Pharaoh himself has some dreams, and it is Joseph who helps interpret those dreams, and Joseph becomes second in command in the country. God orchestrated certain things that caused these people of God, the patriarchs, the men of God, the heroes of faith in the book of Genesis, here and there, to speak about the Lord. But they lived as salt and light. They lived as carriers of the gospel of the kingdom. And even within their own households, many people, such as slaves and servants, came to faith. Hannah, the mistress of Sarah, encountered the Lord God in the desert. And God gave her a special name for himself in the desert, Eliezer, the servant of Abraham likewise. Only Enoch and Noah also demonstrated an evangelism that included proclamation. And we don't see it in the book of Genesis, but we see that from the New Testament. What am I saying? Let's look at the era of Moses. Many years later, when God brought the law to Moses, Israel as a nation was called to live out the promise of the good news that was proclaimed to Abraham by God himself through their obedience to the law. Because if they obeyed the law, the people around them would recognize that this word of God was good news for the weak and the vulnerable, the poor, the alien, the sojourner, the fatherless, the orphan, the widow, the infant, the sick, the slave. And you can go on and on and on in terms of the most needy and vulnerable people. Because under that law of Moses, those who were vulnerable were protected. And Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6 and 8. God clearly shows that the people around Israel who were in need and they were vulnerable, they were poor, they were sick, they were sojourners, they were orphans, etc. They would be saying, oh, I wish I was born in Israel. I wish I was there because I'll be taken care of. Oh, would that I could go to Israel and learn from their God. This is what it says in Deuteronomy. In uh, chapter 4, verse 6 and 8, keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear this statute, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God pays to us whenever we call upon him? What great nation is there that has statutes, ordinances so righteous as all this law which I said before you this day?
And then you go into the New Testament, and Jesus' declaration of believers being the salt of the earth and the life of the world is a theme. For example, in Philippians 2, 14 to 16, do all things without grumbling or questioning. Hello, that speaks to me. I find myself, I read the newspapers, I listen to some of our politicians, and I start remembering and really grumble. And God says, hey, Kimani, do all things without grumbling or questioning. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, not blemished in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that the day of Christ I may be glad, proud, and I do not run in vain or labor in vain. In 2 Corinthians 2 14 to 16, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumph and through us spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the true aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And so you find that what we are reading about having an impact of salt and light is something that is repeated in the New Testament. And uh, there's a passage that I missed. I wanted to just bring that up. In 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3, uh, maybe the passage will come later. You yourselves are a letter of recommendation written on your hearts to be known and read by all men. You show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Christ is saying, you and me, wherever we go, people are reading our lives. You are a letter written not with ink, but by the Holy Spirit, written by Christ himself, to be read by all men. People are reading your life. What are they reading and hearing from you? In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. The same word treasure that we saw in Matthew. Evangelism is anchored on, on being and becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And Colossians also talks in chapter 4, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. And so the theme of you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, is a theme throughout the scriptures. So that when we speak in evangelism, when we meet people around us, or people out of our relational network, and we are talking about Christ, we are talking about the Bible, it smells good, it looks good, it tastes good. There is an aroma, a fragrance of Christ will cause them to say, yeah, I think I need that. I need to listen. And that they do not look at us and step on us underfoot because our lives do not portray what we are speaking. Let's look at the matter of inheritance. Where will I be in eternity? Where will I be in eternity? How do I prepare? How do I prepare for eternity? The first principle, and before I share that, I will say that Jesus speaks to show how his followers, those who truly love him, will prepare for eternity with him while they are here on earth. From Matthew 6, 19 and 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, on, on, in heaven, I beg your pardon, where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I said earlier that Jesus should be our treasure. We 
discussed that yesterday, and I'd like to elaborate further. This word treasure literally refers to things valuable, and is the same word used to describe the treasures that the wise men from the East brought to baby Jesus. And literally, Jesus is telling his disciples to not treasure to their treasures, but to treasure that which is eternal and that cannot be taken away. It cannot trust, it cannot be consumed, it cannot be stolen. In other words, you and I should not be preoccupied with material things, the transient things. For these things are passing away, but we should be occupied with the eternal things. I should have an eternal perspective that enables me to fruitfully live by faith. And it was one of the early navigator leaders who said that we need to invest ourselves in that which is eternal. Three things he mentioned. God, the word of God, and people. Because when people die, they enter into an eternal state, either of punishment or blissfulness in the presence of the Lord. And so we need to invest in our relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father. We need to invest in the scriptures and we need to invest in the advance of the gospel of Jesus and his kingdom. Investing in eternity is one way of preparing for eternity. The second principle is seeking first. In other words, Jesus spoke to stay. Our hearts need to be in a seeking posture with respect to his kingdom and righteousness. Matthew 6, 32 to 33. For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. The reality of Jesus' eternal kingdom and righteousness that we receive through faith in Christ, it should never be subdued by the daily pressures and pursuits of life even those pressures and pursuits that have to do with studies, career development, child raising, provision, investment, family, whatever. This should distinguish us from the loss around us. A good look at any newspaper, any news report, CNN, KBC, NTV, you name it. And the news is about the world. The things that cause us to have pressure, anxiety. And Christ tells us to not be preoccupied with those things, but to be preoccupied by seeking first His kingdom, His righteousness. What preoccupies your mind? I suggest that some of you are probably using your cell phones right now to be on social media. I don't know. But what preoccupies your mind? Is it the love of Jesus for you? Or are you occupied in the pursuit of the material things? If God was to grant you one request, what would it be? Can you think about that? If you were to ask God today one thing, ask me one thing and I'll give it to you. Like God asked Solomon, what would you ask about? If you've never thought about that question, I want you to start thinking about it. Because it is a question that you answer will demonstrate what occupies your mind, what is valuable to you, what is your treasure. If God was to give you one request, what would it be? Jesus honored Mary because he chose the good portion that could not be taken from her. Luke 10, 42. One thing is different, Mary has chosen the good portion it shall not be taken away from her. The default mindset for the believer is to seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Words amplified in several passages of the New Testament. We also need to live knowing life is all about Christ. Because if Jesus is my ultimate desire, passion, and goal, and treasure, he will be completely sufficient for me. He will be my glory, my gain, and my goal, as Paul argues in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. 
onwards. Verse 3, for we are the true circumcision, worship God in spirit, and glory in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ. Christ my glory, Christ my gain. Verse 13 and 14, I'll read verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call, call of God in Christ Jesus. Christ is my glory, Christ is my gain, Christ is my goal. We should, all, we should also live our lives seeking and setting our minds on Him, as we read in Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2. If you have been raised with Christ, and we have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above when Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on earth. That's what it means for Jesus to be my treasure. That he is completely sufficient for me. He alone is my Lord, Savior, Rock, Fortress, Refuge, Refuge, Stronghold. Apart from Jesus, I have no good thing. And so naturally, this means that every sin I struggle with shows Jesus is not yet completely sufficient for me. And so I need to consciously be laying up treasure in heaven, examining my heart to see if my devotion to Jesus has waned or withered, so that I can honestly and truthfully invest in eternity, in preparing for eternity. Are you preparing for an eternity with Jesus Christ? How are you doing that? How is your academic study or studies, your relationships? How is that preparing you for eternity with Christ? When you are given the power to do all that pertains, God himself has given you power to do all that pertains to bring in glory to the Father so that you may spend an eternity of blissfulness with Jesus Christ. How are you preparing for that? Are you ready to die? I never knew you. General Francis Ogola. In his death, I got to love a man. I was to show a video, I had sent it to Bethel, but I forgot to uh, project it. And it's his son talking about General Francis Ogola. See, you are General Francis Ogola. So you all can eh? <laughs> And how, as a military officer who's a general, the lowest caliber of a soldier or even a worker like a cleaner, they knew one thing. He treated them with respect and dignity. You would see him jogging with ordinary soldiers. He would be doing 80 press ups. That is my age. 80 press ups. Wangapo and the mother of 80 press ups up. Kill us. <laughs> and General Ogola, what you don't know about him, some of my colleagues will be talking in a WhatsApp group. In 1982, he and a friend of uh, in my network, they joined a very famous auditing company in Nairobi. And they were audit trainees, and they were both admitted to the university, and both of them were top students. Top students. And as a student in university, General Ogola decided to do what? Quit and go to the military cadet academy to become a military officer. Now, in the eyes of Kenyans, it was a step down. But he was called because he understood one thing. It's not about money, it's about purpose and calling. And in every area of his life, as a military officer, General Ogola excelled and he had a reputation as a man of integrity. He would tell you to do what he himself would do. 
And now we are discovering in his death, it is because he had Christ in him, the hope of glory. That it was the aroma of Christ, the salt of the earth, the light of the world. I wish I had met him before he died. And Jesus speaks about the promise of a word. The scriptures, when they speak of God, they speak of him as a one who rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. And we read that Jesus, uh, rather, Jesus tells us of the Father rewarding those who are accustomed to uh, the secret place in Matthew 6, verse 4, so that your arms may be in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you, verse 6. Pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you, verse 18. That your fasting may not be seen by men, but by your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. This reward is granted here on earth, and it will also be granted in eternity. Because the Lord is the one who rewards or equips everyone for the deeds done in the body. Suffice to say that our Father in heaven is a rewarder of everyone who seeks him diligently, as Abraham was told, I am your shield, your very great reward. And as Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us, I cannot expect or claim to expect a reward from God in eternity. If I am not now in this present state seeking him diligently and experiencing him as my ultimate reward. So how are you experiencing the reward of the Father today as one who diligently seeks after him? Is God your shield and your reward? Jesus also gives us a promise of receiving the kingdom of God. And when he speaks about the kingdom in the four gospels, he speaks of it as the kingdom of God has come, the kingdom of God will come. In the present tense, present continuous, and in the future tense. And he gave assurances to the disciples, saying several times, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Speaking at a time when the Jews were expecting a Messiah to deliver them from Rome. And he comes with a different paradox, as we saw yesterday. Because Jesus unveiled and ushered the kingdom of heaven, not in the way that the Jews and religious leaders had expected. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verse 3. Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a promise of inheriting and experiencing and being part of and in the kingdom of God that will endure for eternity. An assurance of salvation that is confirmed by the deposit of character. And then he speaks about a promise of seeing God in Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with all men and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Revelation 2, 4. They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Is there anything that you desire but to see the presence and the face of God? That's what Jesus prayed for us in John 17. And Jesus speaks about the promise of inheriting the earth. Somebody asked me about this yesterday. Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek of the Gentile, or the, or the gentle and humble. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek are humble, they are gentle in spirit. And because of this, they use their eyes, their ears, their nostrils more than they use what? More than they use what? Their mouth to speak. They listen more than they speak. They discern more than they speak. They see and discern because they are good listeners and learners. And as for the gospel, the meek see and discern the voice of Christ because they have become good listeners and learners. They listen to him when other people are reading the scriptures, when they read the scriptures. 
They will therefore inherit the earth to the extent that they will be wise and understanding. As James says in chapter 3 of James verse 13, Who is wise and understanding? By his good life, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. God has said, I will promote who? The humble. So the meek will inherit the earth to the extent that God will be at work in them. They will be discovering things about God because of their meekness. But Jesus is also promising that the meek, the gentle, the humble will inherit the new heaven and the new earth. The home of righteousness that God will make to restore what was lost at the beginning. Because in the book of Genesis, what was given to man was lost. And now creation grows as it waits for the sons of God to be revealed. Sons who have acknowledged their unworthiness and surrendered to Jesus Christ and are meek and gentle and humble. A remnant from the earth who enter the city which has foundations whose build and make as God, they shall see God. It's not exciting. Less than a pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you know how Paul thought about this exhilarating expectation in Philippians 1? For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. His life was about Christ, death was gain for him. Verse 21 of chapter 1 and verse 22. If it is to be alive in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. If I don't die and I remain here, I am going to advance the gospel of Jesus and his kingdom into the nations. I am going to preach wherever God sends me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I have had rest between the two. My desire is to depart, to die, and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul is talking about the reality of the believer, labor. We should have this desire in our hearts to be part of in Christ. And at the same time, we should have that complete commitment to remain on this earth for one purpose, to see Christ glorified. So this is not to say you should not be a good student. No. You should be a good student. You should excel in your studies. It is to say, as you excel in your studies, that the character in your life and the purpose of your life, as far as Christ is concerned, is also visible to those around you. What awaits me when I die? I should not think of myself as I am not going to hell. But rather, I should think of myself as one looking forward to spending eternity with Jesus, seeing his face and his glory in his father's house. Do your choices, your choices show that you love Jesus? Do they show that you're preparing to spend an eternity with him? Are you investing in the things that matter for eternity? Will you make friends in heaven? Because through your life, heaven is being populated by humanity. What will be your crown when Christ returns in glory? What will be my crown? Our God and our Father, We are sorry for the things that we have seen and do the demonstrate that it is not about Christ. Where we have not lived in a manner that shows that Christ is our Lord, our fortress, our Lord, our Savior, our glory, our gain, our glory. Thank you for those things that you do in our hearts. And give us evidence and witness that God is at work in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Thank you for what Christ did for us on the cross. Would you help us, Lord? 
to be a people who truly have the identity in Christ that you desire us to have, so that we will become like him and impact the world around us with a glory that brings glory to you, with the works that bring glory to you. Would you cause us to be intimate with Jesus and to imitate him because you're transforming our hearts from within? Would you cause our relationships to be those relationships that honor you? Lord, we ask you to minister to us in accordance with the words that we have read and meditated upon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.